So we're starting chapter 3, and it's more of a concentration on plotting polynomial functions. So here is the general definition of a polynomial function. So a polynomial function f of degree n, where n is a non-negative number, is given by, here we go, f of x, so we've defined the function name to be f, and our <coughs> independent variable will be x as normal. f of x is equal to a sub n times x to the nth plus a sub n to the minus 1 times x to the n minus 1 plus 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 a1x plus a to the 0. Now that looks like a really <coughs> difficult definition. Let's finish it out and I'll show you it's not really, it's just standard mathematical notation. I was kind of surprised about this part, in particular this part. What they've given you is the general definition of a polynomial function. So here are our variables and their powers. So these are our variable terms. And the a n, a sub n's, are our coefficients to those variable term terms. And it says that our largest, the coefficient of our largest degree term, is not zero. But all of the others can be zero. And all of the others, all of our coefficients, can be complex numbers. And like I said, this, this must look may be really complex to you. It's really not. I'm going to give you a few examples. Now, this is absolutely true. They can be complex numbers. But we're going to be plotting these functions. And since we're going to be plotting these functions, they're never going to be complex numbers. Because then the output might be complex, and you don't know how to plot a complex valued function. So for us, you can just pretend that they're all going to be real numbers. So let's take a look. Let's look at a degree 5 polynomial function. So our degree of the function is always so polynomial function, if we want to be more explicit, in the variable x. So it's going to be a degree 5. That means the degree of our highest term will be degree 5. So it's going to have to have an x to the fifth term. Now I'm going to say that x to the fifth term is going to have a coefficient of 5. Let's not do 5. Let's do a coefficient of 3. The reason I changed it to 3 is there's absolutely no reason why the coefficient and the exponent value, in this case 5, are the same. Plus 1 half x to the fourth minus x plus one. So that looks really, really different than this definition here. Our general definition says f of x is going to be expressed in the form it's a fifth degree it's a degree five polynomial. So a to the fifth x to the fifth plus a to the fourth, x to the fourth, plus a to the third, x to the third, plus a square, a to the a sub two, x squared. I probably not been saying these right. This is a sub five or a a sub five, a sub four, a sub three, a sub two. 
a sub 1 x I'm not going to write the 1 plus a sub 0 so remember we have one other stipulation so what I've done is I've actually our n value is the degree of our polynomial so I have a degree 5 polynomial so n is equal to 5 so here is my given polynomial and this is the general form right here form for degree 5 polynomial so let's identify our a to the fifth coefficient is equal to 3 our a to the fourth coefficient or a sub 4 coefficient, I'm doing it again, is 1 half. But we don't have an x to the, three, x to the third or a degree 3 term or a degree t 2 term. This is a degree 5 term. This is a degree 4 term. Then we skip all the way down and get a degree 1 term and then a degree 0 term. So our a sub 3 coefficient is equal to 0 because 0 times any number raised to the third power is still 0 and ditto our a sub 2 term the coefficient is 0 now going down here our degree 1 term its coefficient is minus 1 and our degree 0 term is our constant term which is 1. So in general f of x could be written this way 3x to the fifth plus 1 half x to the fourth plus 0 x to the third plus 0 x squared minus x plus 1. But since we, these are zeros, we say these, term van, these terms vanish, and we don't bother to write them. All we bother to write are the terms whose coefficients, our a sub n numbers, are not equal to 0. That's all we bother to write. So let's look at some other classifications so our function by classification of their degree are given names so if our degree of our polynomial function is zero then it's called a constant function and in this case we're given a specific example f of x is equal to 2 our a sub 0 coefficient is 2 that's our leading coefficient if the degree of our polynomial is a one is a degree 1 polynomial then it's called a linear polynomial and here is a specific example 5x minus 1 remember the leading polynomial sorry, the leading coefficient on our degree in polynomial can never be zero. So in this case, our a1 coefficient is five. If we have a degree two polynomial, then it's called a quadratic. And here's a specific example of a quadratic polynomial function whose a sub two coefficient is 4. We just can call it the leading coefficient. If the degree, degree of our polynomial is 3, we call it a cubic function. And in this particular example here, our leading coefficient, a sub 3, is 2. And here, if we have a degree 4 polynomial, they're, qual they're called quartics. And in this particular function, degree 4 function, 
our a sub 4 coefficient, our leading coefficient, is 1. Now, do they do Kintic? No. Now, they stop at the Quartic. We also have no, one more name uh, for degree 5 called Kintics. Probably goes higher than that, but it's good enough that they stop right there. The focus of this particular section is going to be quadratics. So the function f of x is equal to 0 is called the zero polynomial. So it's a constant function of a special type. Every input value gives you the output value of zero. But it doesn't have a degree because it can't have a degree zero function. I mean, it can't have degree zero because it says the leading coefficient can't be zero. So we just simply call it the zero polynomial and say it doesn't have a degree. It's a special case. So here is a quadratic function. It has the form f of x is equal to a sub 2 x squared plus a sub 1 x plus a naught. It's a degree 2. We know that our a2 coefficient is not 0, but our a1 coefficient could be 0, and our a0 coefficient or our, or our a0 coefficient could be 0. The only thing we know is if it's a degree in polynomial, the leading coefficient, which is the coefficient attached to the degree in term, is not 0. Again, this is just the definitions given to in your book. They say our a1, a2, and a0 um, coefficients are complex numbers. And here, I actually add, in, mo in most cases, they will be real numbers. Since we're going to be plotting them, they will be real numbers in all cases. And in most of our cases, not only will they be real numbers, they'll be rational numbers. And in many cases, they will be integers. So here is our famous graph. This is called the squaring function. And now you know the squaring function is a quadratic function. So let's look at it. So here is something that I've said before and I'm going to say it again. And here is a really important note. Seems like it's been forever since I've taped a lecture. So the this is a statement about the domain. The domain of a polynomial function is minus infinity to infinity. Another way to write that, I saw some of you all writing it on your exam. I've mentioned it before, it's not used in our book, but the symbol R with that double bar right there is also just another name for this set. So remember this interval is a set and R is just another name for this set. Your book always uses this. This is so much easier and if you're going to go on to math, higher math, you'll be using that. However, the question for polynomial functions then is never about the domain, it's the range. So let's, I'm going to try to freehand draw a polynomial function just really fast. That means I need a, not only a polynomial function, but a quadratic function. That won't be very good because I'm freehanding it and you can see right there. So remember, the range is the values if you're walking up and down the y-axis 
and you look left, <laughs> that's right, if, if you look right or left, and you can see any part of your function, then that corresponding point is part of the domain. So let's just look right here. It doesn't do a very good job, but the way I've drawn this, it looks like the lowest point on my function is about right here. That's where it bottoms out. So if I move right over to here and hit the y-axis, if I go down, if I'm down below here and look to my right or look to my left, those points are not going to be in my, in my range. Why? Because I'm not seeing any part of, of this parabola that I tried to draw. But from this point here all the way up to infinity, all of that is going to be in the range. So what I wanted to say here is that the range for quadratic functions depends on the highest or lowest point on the parabola because <clears throat> we will soon see that quadratic functions are all some type of a parabola. So right there is a parabola and it's a parabola that opens up and we will say that point right there is the lowest point. On the other hand, a parabola that opens down, this point right here, say, would be the highest point. And we'll talk more about that later on. And we'll actually see how that works. So given this specific parabola right here, nicely plotted out with a table of values, so this f of x is equal to x squared, we see that the, the domain is minus infinity to infinity, but the range starts at and includes zero, and then goes all the way to infinity. So for this particular function, we already know the domain. The domain is easy. The question for quadratic functions is always going to be the range. The range is going to include zero, and that's the lowest point, and it includes it. And then all the way up, you can see they've highlighted in green to infinity. Of course, infinity is not a point, so we use the open symbol on the right-hand side. This is the closed symbol on the left-hand side. Remember, the closed symbol means zero is included. The open symbol means whatever is in it is not included in the set. <clears throat> so here it is. Our main, this is the main page. This is the one you've got to put in your notes and, and know how to use. So in our last class we already did, <coughs> well, at some point in chapter two, we looked at graphing techniques. And here is all of that, those graphing techniques combined into one formula when it talks about quadratics. So x minus h, h, this represents a horizontal shift. So if h is greater than zero, it's h units to the right. If h is less than zero, 
It's the absolute value of h units to the left. And what did we do to make that so much easier? Let's again just do a quick example. Suppose I have f of x is equal to x plus 5 squared. And then I'll have d of x is equal to x minus 1 half squared. So in order to deal, to just completely ignore this right here, h units to the right if h is greater than 0, the absolute value of h units left if h is less than 0, is, recall, we take what's in parentheses and we set it equal to 0. x plus 5 is equal to 0 and we solve for x. That gives us x is equal to minus 5. So the minus means a shift to the left. Here we're going to take x minus 1 half and set it to 0. That's going to give us x is equal to 1 half and that is a shift to the right. In other words, negative on our number line, on our number line, going to the right, that's our zero. This over here is positive, and this over here is negative. So that means left, if we have a left, it's a shift to the, if we have a negative, it's a shift to the left, and x is equal to positive one-half, it's a shift to the right. So on back here, if a is greater than zero, these, these are two new ones here. So if a is greater than zero, then it's not reflected across the x-axis. So that means it opens up, just like your normal parabola here. It opens up. So that's what it means to open up. If a is less than zero, <coughs> a can't be zero, then it opens down. It's a reflection across the x-axis. If the absolute value of a is greater than one, it's vertically stretched. And I swear vertically stretched doesn't really do anything to me, but it tells you that it's more narrow or narrower, and that does. It's more narrow than the parent function f of x is equal to x squared. If a is the absolute value of a is between 0 and 1, then it's vertically shrunk which means it's wider. And over here, finally, if we add to all of that a k value, then we have a shift of the entire graph up if k is greater than zero, or exactly down if k is less than zero. How many k units? So let's do a little bit of just a little bit of graphing. For the most part, I don't want you to do tables of values. That's, that's really not what this is about. But um, we do want to see what the picture of these functions look like, the picture meaning the graph. So we're going to graph using tables of values the following a and b functions, but for our c function, or our big f of x, we're going to use this right here to help us out. So this is an exercise for you to do. So we want to plot f of x is equal to x squared minus 4x minus 2. It's not in the form given to us above, so we really can't use 
that information. <coughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to make a table of values. That table of values is going to have nine columns. Sorry, nine rows, not columns. That would be way overkill. <coughs> so X is going to be X, our X value. And this is going to be our Y value. Remember, F of X is the same as Y. So that's going to be X squared minus 4X minus 2. And we're going to do the following values, minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So what I want you to do is pause the video right now, and I'm going to work the first one. Uh, let's go ahead and make this bigger. There's no reason. I don't know. Sorry. When I magnify it, it, when I magnify it, it can. Its resolution is kind of fixed, as you can see. So I'm going to do this for first one. So minus four. X is minus four. So minus four squared minus four is the base. So minus four times minus four is sixteen minus 4 times x, which is minus 4. So minus 4 times minus 4 is plus 16 minus 2. And that gives me 30. So I have a point on the graph is minus 4 and 30. So go ahead and fill out the rest of this column. It's not that hard, but it's good practice. Okay, I'm assuming you've paused it. Maybe it's a bad assumption. So in this column, I got 19. I'm not going to do the math. Uh, this column is 20. Sorry, this column is 10. This column value is 3. This was minus 2. That one was super simple. Minus 5. Minus 6. Minus 5 minus 2. So this was, <coughs> this, each one of these is a point on a graph. Minus 3, 19, minus 2, 10, etc. So let's actually see what that looks like. <coughs> so let's start with our point minus 4 and 30. I need to come out a little bit. So there's a point minus 4 and 30 right there. Then we have our point minus 3 and 19, minus 2 and 10, minus 1 and 3, 0 and minus 2. So that's where it crosses the y-axis. It's the y-intercept. 1 and minus 5, 2 and minus 6, 3 and minus 5, and 4 and minus 2. So, you know, I didn't know. <clears throat> it looks like it's kind of lopsided. We got a lot of, you know, fill in the dots here. And then it goes down. But let's go ahead and, and see what the actual function looks like. So that is the graph of x squared minus 4x minus 2. So let's do the same thing for our next function. Now, f next function, oh, there's, <laughs> that's a typo. There should only be one equal sign there. So g of x is equal to 1 half x squared. So you already know that you can use this up here. So let's, let's take a look at this. And then we'll go ahead and, and we'll plot it as well just using tables of values, but it'll be a lot easier. So 
So here we had, what is it, g of x maybe, I think it was g of x, is equal to 1 half x squared. So what I want to compare it to <coughs> is f of x is equal to a over x minus h plus k. Can I write g of x that way, filling in the values of a and h and k? Well, I can. g of x is equal to 1 half x minus 0 squared plus 0. So the only thing this is, is the only hat we have a is equal to 1 half, h is equal to 0, and k is equal to 0. So it's not going to be shifted up or down. It's not going to be moved horizontally right or left. But it is going to be vertically shrunk. It's going to be wider because our a value in absolute, the absolute value of 1 half is 1 half, and 1 half is less than 1 but greater than 0. So it's going to be vertically shrunk. So this one isn't hard to do, and let's not do a table of values. I'm tired of table of values. Let's just look at this one uh, on GeoGebra. So if we did table of values, we would have minus 4 and 8 using the same same set of inputs minus 4 to po positive 4 so we have minus 4 and 8 minus 3 and 9 halves minus 2 and 2 minus 1 and 1 half 0 and 0 which is no surprise shouldn't be 1 and 1 half 2 and 2 3 and 9 halves, or 3 and 4.5, and 4 and 8. And here is the actual function. And let's take a look at its parent function. I don't know what I did there. There we go. So there's its parent function. It doesn't have any points on it. Let me move this down some. So you can see that this is a is a widening of the parent function denoted by that. Okay. Now, let's go back to our final example here. Here we have one in its full glory. So let's go ahead and, and figure out this one. And again, we won't use a table of values. Kind of over that. In particular, I mean, just to be honest with you, if, if, any, if any of you take statistics or, or go into anything where mathematics is used, the amount of data that we have to deal with these days is enormous. So we use computational methods to sift through it and give us information. So I don't mind using Conceptual is really the only thing I'm going for right now. Whoops. I want to erase this. Come down narrow again. So here we're given f of x is equal to minus 1 half x minus 4 that's supposed to be a squared there. I'm just noticing I didn't write that. Plus 3. So my a value, my a value is minus 1 half. My h value is equal to 4. And my k value is equal to 3. So the absolute value of minus one half is equal to one half. And one half is between zero and one. So this is going to be a widening of my parent function. Now if we set x minus four equal to zero and solve for x, 
I get x is equal to positive 4. So that's going to be a horizontal shift of 4 units to the right. And then my k value is 3, and k is positive. So that's going to be a vertical shift. up by three units. So let's actually see that one. I did all of these before. Last thing I wanted to do was to do tables of values for this particular lecture. So this is our parent function. f of x is equal to x squared. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to consider a new function g of x is equal to x minus 4 squared. So that should give me a shift from my parent function 4 units to the right, and indeed it does. Now I'm going to consider h of x is equal to minus x minus 4 squared. So that should be a reflection across the x-axis. So when I turn that on, I should see basically this be mirrored down. So I'll just let you see that so you know what I'm talking about. Right there it is. Now I'm going to multiply this graph by one half to get minus one half x minus four squared. So we're going to expect a widening of my orange values here. So let's move this one up because that's this is what we're looking at now. That's where we've got to. So when I do that, indeed, with the purple, you can see a widening of it. Why? Because 1 half in absolute value is greater than 0 but less than 1. And then the final thing we're going to do is add 3. So we're going to expect now the vertical shift upward of 3 units. So in other words, this highest point right here, which we will soon call the apex, is going to go up three units. So that's one, two, three. So it should move up to about right there. And indeed it does. So there you go. So I'm not going to do some graph paper if you wanted to graph that. So that was a kind of that was kind of nice, wasn't it? we were able to do all of that when we converted it into that form. So our first, the problem was, is our first example wasn't converted into that form. f of x is equal to a times, in parentheses, x minus h squared plus k. So how are we going to get it into that form? Well, we're going to be doing it by completing the square. So let's do that right now. <clears throat> Notice what's nice here. When I have to do it by completing the square, remember completing the square, the formula, only works if the leading coefficient is 1. Those are called monic polynomials. So by, by definition, our leading value here will always be a. Now we're going to get into a complication in a little bit. I don't remember if this lecture or not, but I'll show you how to do it when it's not a. So we're given f of x is equal to x squared minus 6x plus 7. So my b term is equal to minus 6. So my b halves term is equal to minus 6 divided by 2 is minus 3. So my b halves squared is equal to 9. So all we're dealing with right here is just this. So x squared minus 6x plus your b halves, minus 3, plus 7, not minus 3, 
I'm adding my b hat squared plus 9 plus 7 but I have that's equal to f of x right but I added a 9 to this side so I have to add a 9 to the other side and what else am I going to do I'm going to move my 7 over here x squared minus 6x plus 9 is equal to f of x plus 9 minus 7. I'll do this uh, and then perhaps I'll, I'll come back and do this again starting from the very beginning and this gives us x minus 3 squared is equal to f of x 9 minus 7 is plus 2 and then we're going to move it back over so x minus 3 squared minus 2 is equal to f of x and it doesn't matter if the f is a small or a large letter so that's the same thing as saying f of x is equal to x minus 3 squared minus 2. So let's do that one more time, okay? I have a feeling some of you want a more systemic approach. So we're given f of x is equal to x squared. If you're okay with this, you can just skip ahead. f squared, x squared minus 6x plus 7. So your first step is going to meet, take the constant term and move it to the other side. So f of x minus 7 is equal to x squared minus 6x. So my our b term is minus 6. So our b halves term is minus 3. And our b halves squared term is 9. So my next step is to add 9 across the board. Like that. Now, what that does in my next step is I'm going to simplify. Minus 7 plus 9 is plus 2. And this is equal to x, and then I put in my b halves term, which is minus 3, and it's squared. And then I just move the constant term 2 over to the side. And it becomes minus 2. So what we're going to do is now just discuss this. This is going to be this is my parent function. It's going to be moved over. So the lowest point right there is going to be moved over three units because x minus 3 equals 0 means x is equal to plus 3. So it's going to be shifted horizontally to the right by three units. And then it's going to be moved down the whole freaking thing minus two vertically. And let's go ahead, I guess, and see what that looks like. It's not going to kill us to do that. Uh, let me start up another... And it was, let's do our parent function, x squared. It's our parent function. And let's see what that function looks like if it shifted 3 to the right. And then let's see what that function looks like when it's shifted down by 2. And right there we have it. So there you go. This is the final transformation. Here's our original parent function. We shifted it 3 to the 
right and then two units down. And here are, <coughs> here's a bunch of, of good stuff. Again, the kind of cool thing about this is you don't have to memorize it, but we will want to look at it. So what I'm going to do right here is I'm going to go ahead and snip it out. Maybe take a screenshot here. Snip it all the way out. Start a brand new canvas and paste that. Get it up here so we can look at it. So here is the theorem. So let f of x equal ax squared plus bx plus c be a quadratic function, any quadratic function, not necessarily a monic function. It doesn't say anything at all about a being 0. Now notice here our normal, the, the normal way they would do it, they would write a2, a sub 2, a sub 1, a sub 0, but we use this form so many times we just use a, b, and c rather than our a sub 2, a sub 1, a sub 0. They just mean our coefficients. Then, it's a theorem, f of x can be written as f of x is equal to a times x minus h squared plus k for some a, h, and k. And what are the values of a and k? h, sorry, not a and k, but h, h is equal to minus b over 2a. And k is equal to 4ac minus b squared. So that's minus the discriminant. So if you want to have that memorized, the discriminant is b squared minus 4ac. So this is minus the, the, the discriminant, 4ac minus b squared, divided by 4a. So here are the cool properties. The point h comma k is the vertex of the polynomial. So the vertex of the polynomial is the lowest point if it opens up, or if it opens down, it's the highest point. So these are all opening down, so right here is the vertex of these. So we actually know where it's at. The point h comma k is the vertex of the polynomial, its highest or its lowest point. And the vertical line x equals h is the axis of its vertical symmetry. So it's a vertical symmetry. If I crease the paper down the y, that, that x equals h, remember, that is the equation of a vertical line. If I folded the paper over, I would get both sides of the graph. The graph opens up if a is greater than 0 and opens down if a is le less than 0. If a is greater than 0, then the range, isn't this great? Is k inclusive to infinity? If a is less than 0, its openings that down, then it's minus infinity to k. The graph of f of x is wider than the graph of y equals x squared if the absolute value of a is less than 1, and more narrow if the absolute value of a is greater than 1. The y-intercept is always the point 0, f of 0, which is 0, comma, c. That c right there corresponds to that c right there. So again, that's easy to get. The x, sorry, the x-intercepts are found by solving ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to 0. How do you solve that two ways? You factor it or you use the quadratic formula. So <clears throat> this is the discriminant. This is the negative discriminant. If b squared minus 4ac is greater than 0, then we use the quadratic equation to find the solution. 
if b squared minus 4ac is equal to 0, we don't even have to factor it. The x-intercept is minus b over 2a over 0. What is minus b over 2a? It's the value of h. If b squared minus 4ac is less than 0, then the graph does not intercept the x-axis at all. It's always above the x-axis or always below the x-axis. So two points here I want to make. Remember that any point on the graph of a function, any point x, y, when we're talking about a point that lays on the graph of a function, cor corresponds to the point x, f of x. Hence, the point h, k is the same as h, f of h. So k is really equal to the function evaluated at the point h. That might be helpful. Down here, of course, the y-intercept is found by just plugging in the value 0 is the input value of the function, and the x-intercepts are found. The x-intercepts happen when y is equal to 0, so we have to find what value of x gives us f of x equals to 0. In this case, what I want to know are the values of x. And that's the reason we break out the quadratic formula. So let's do an example. <clears throat> so with this, we are asked Seriously? Well, this is completely, it's not working. I'll just write it down. It's frozen. Sometimes it does that. Everything may be frozen. If everything is frozen on me, and it seems to be, go ahead and quit that. And we'll start all over again. Sometimes, I mean, it's such a simple formula. I'll paste these big bitmaps in there, and it locks up. Linux is not free of freezing people. All the software is free, and it's great. It's super fast. I don't have to wait forever. It's not buggy. Uh, I'll never go back to Windows, and Macs are too expensive. I can't justify the, the price. Uh, and a lot of mathematics software is written exclusively for Linux. We pretty much all work in open source. And Linux is the perfect operating sy system for open source. So we have f of x is equal to 2x squared plus 4x plus 5. Now notice here is the thing, let me make sure we, and here in parentheses, can't complete the square. That's really not true. We can't complete the square. Why? It, its leading coefficient coefficient is not equal to 1. Now we could do that. We could actually still complete the square. And what we would do is we would divide everything by 2. And this is how it would proceed. I'm just going to give you an example of the niceties of that, that box I just gave you. 
I'm going to divide everything by 2. So I have f of x divided by 2 is equal to x squared. 4x divided by 2 is 2x plus 5 halves. Now I can go ahead and complete the square. And then once I've completed the square, and I've moved everything back over to the other side, so I will have f of x divided by 2 is going to be x minus h squared plus k. What do I do? I multiply everything by 2. And that's going to give me f of x is equal to 2x minus h squared plus 2k. But we don't have to do any of that. The beauties about this is we literally are given a formula. Literally given a formula. So again, we were given f of x is equal to 2x squared plus 4x plus 5. So that's Let's write that as a x squared plus b x plus c. So a is equal to 2, b is equal to 4, and c is equal to 5. So we want to find the point h k. And remember what is the point h k? The point HK is the vertex of the parabola. So H, by formula, is equal to minus B over 2 times A. So that's equal to minus 4 over 2. And what is my A value? 2. So it's equal to minus 1. So h is equal to minus 1. And here is the cool thing. We have a formula for k. k is equal to 4ac minus b squared over 4a. And you can literally find k by plugging in the values of a and C and B. But we learned, again, this is a point that li lies on the graph. So that's H, F of H. And it's going to be so much easier to compute F of H. F of H, well, H is minus 1 is equal to 2 times minus 1 squared plus 4 times minus 1 plus 5. So that's 2 minus 4 plus 5. So that's equal to 3. Wow! So my vertex is at minus 1 and 3. So, what else do I know? The value of A is positive. So, let's kind of sketch a little graph out here. So, I'm, I'm not going to go back. What you need to do is, probably for the best part of this, is to have this page in front of you so you can read it off. But I'm not going to try to recopy it into the screen because it nearly locked it up and there's nothing more unpleasant to me to be honest with you than have to pause one of these and use video editing to edit them together it's really not difficult to be honest with you but it's extra work and it takes time to render and I don't want to take the time to render so this is my vertex this is my vertex coordinate. So minus 1 and 3. So I'm going to say that's minus 1 
I'm just going to say this is minus 1 and 3. Since A is greater than 0, it opens up. And since A is greater than 1, then that represents a narrowing of the graph of the parent function. The value of, um, I guess we should go ahead and I'll bring this up. So the graph opens up because A is equal to 2 and it's greater than 0. And if A is greater than 0, the range is K to infinity. So the range here, we know it's going to open up. So the range is going to be my value of k is 3 to infinity. Since the absolute value of a is equal to the absolute value of 2, which is 2, I'm on point number 3, um, no, I'm on point number 4, the graph is more narrow because the absolute value of A is greater than 1. We'll look at all this later on. Now let's find the y-intercept. The y-intercept is 0, f of 0. So I'm just going to plug in 0 for x. f of 0 is equal to 2 times 0 squared plus 4 times 0 plus 5 which is equal to 5. So right there where it crosses the y-axis is 0, 5. I've now got two points on my graph. The x-intercepts are found by solving ax squared plus bx plus c. So let's compute the discriminant. The discriminant is b squared minus 4ac. So b squared is 4 squared minus 4 times 2 times 5. Well, that's 16 minus 4 times 5 is 20. 16 minus 40. So, <clears throat> so that is... 16 minus 40 is less than 0, and that's all we care about. So that means that the graph does not intercept the y-axis. But we don't even need to know that, because I know that the point minus 1 and 3, which is above the x-axis, is its lowest point. Why do I know it's its lowest point? Because A is positive, so it opens up. So I know it's never going to cra uh, cross the x-axis down here. And the range is 3 infinity. So I know, again, it never crosses the x-axis because 0 is not in that set. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at this. I'll go ahead and use this one. So it turned out that the function that we just plotted, 2x squared plus 4x plus 5. And there we go. There is the point minus 1 and 3. And so lowest point. And right there, it crosses the y-axis. We know it's pointing up, so I don't even have to do the last test to see if it crosses the x-axis. I know already that it does not cross the x-axis because I have a, uh, a picture of it. So let's do another one. Yeah, this one, will, I'm sure it's going to cross the x-axis. 
Uh, I don't have one here. Example 2 is missing. It's kind of weird. No, is that it? So we're going to do another example. I don't know why it's, so, it's on your, not on your sheet. Uh, but this example is going to be x squared minus 6x plus 7. So I'll just go ahead and write it down here. I don't know why it's not on yours. Pro I may have uh, excluded it because of time. So this is just going to be another example. Another example. The example I'm sure is in your book. I usually don't make these up. Uh, for some reason, it's not in the sheet I just pulled up and was showing you. x squared minus 6x plus 7. So again, the way to do this is to identify ax squared plus bx plus c. So a is equal to 1, b is equal to minus 6, and c is equal to 7. So let's find h k which is the same as the point h f of h. It's much easier to find h. By the formula h is equal to minus b over 2 times a. So you know a can never be 0. So that's equal to minus minus 6 over 2 times a which is, is which is 6 divided by 2 which is 3 so f of h is equal to f of 3 which is 3 squared minus 6 times 3 plus 7. That's going to be 9 minus 18 plus 7, which is 9, sorry, which is minus 9 plus 7, because 9 minus 18 is minus 9, which is equal to minus 2. So my vertex is 3 minus 2. So my a value is 1. Okay, that's fine. So that means it opens up. So let's kind of just take a little sketch right here. Sorry, I'm just kind of sticking with this color right here. Maybe I'll do another one. So 3 minus 2. 3 and minus 2 is right there. It's Sunday, that's my parents calling, but I'll just call them back. And since A is greater than 0, that means it's going to open up. Oh, okay, so it opens up, so that means the range is going to be the k to infinity, which is minus 2 to infinity. And what do we notice right here? We notice immediately that it does cross the x-axis. So let's find out where it's going to cross the y. So f of h, sorry, f of 0 f of 0 is equal to 7. So it's going to cross at 0, 7. That's the y-intercept. Okay, they've given up. Notice now your parents call. I don't know if you could hear that or not. They first called my cell, and then they called my my landline. I'll call them when this is over and we're almost over. So the only thing left to do, we kind of have a sketch of it. If I were to extend this out, 
um, just a sketch now we would see not a very good sketch but it would cross the y-axis here at the point 0, 07 so now we just want to know the value of the two points and we already know that it crosses the x-axis so we want to figure out the value of b squared minus 4ac we already know it will be greater than 0 or equal to 0 because it crosses the x-axis so let's find that out and I won't use the quadratic formula if it does I'll let you do it on your own so b squared minus 4ac that's minus 6 squared minus 4 times 1 times 7 so it's 36 minus 28 so that's greater than 0 it's not equal to 0 so what it tells us right now is we must use the quadratic formula and the quadratic formula will give us two distinct values for x and those will be the values of x y will be equal to zero in both cases it will be this value of x and this value of x and they will be irrational two distinct roots one last thing and we'll call it a um, a night is we're going to do this particular question and the only thing we're going to do is we're going to ask these questions because we've done this one before a ball is projected directly upward from an initial height of 100 feet with an initial velocity of 80 feet per second use the formula s of t is equal to minus 16 t squared plus v naught t plus s naught well v naught is the initial velocity so that's 80 feet per second so v naught is 80 and s naught is the initial height so that's 100 so give a function that describes the height of the ball in terms of the time t so let's go ahead and do that so this is just a function in the variable t so all I'm doing here is from what I'm given v naught is the initial velocity which is 80t plus 100 so let's now look this is a polynomial in the variable t but we're this is squared sorry that should be squared right there so we're used to seeing something like this a x squared plus b x plus c but now instead of x's I have t's so it's easy my a is equal to minus 16 what does that tell you it opens down my b is equal to 80 and my c is equal to 100 so give a function that describes the height of the ball that's the function right there after how many seconds does the ball reach its maximum height so we want to find the point h k and the value of h is the x value or in other words the t value so h at its maximum height is given by minus b over 2a which is minus minus 16 over 2 times 80 which is 16 over 2 times 80 which is 16 divided by 2 is 8 over 80 which is 1 tenth so at 
equals h equals one tenth of a second it reaches its maximum height. Did I get that wrong? I have something wrong written down here. Can you all, I wish you all could speak to me right now. Yeah, B is minus B over 2A minus B. Oh, I did do it wrong. Sorry. That's the reason I have this. I wrote minus A over 2B, didn't I? Well, that's equal to minus 80 over 2 times minus 16. So that's going to be a positive number that reduces to 5 halves. So 5 halves seconds. So there we go. That's corrected. So after 5 halves seconds, we reach our highest point. At what interval of time is the height of the ball greater than 160 feet? So in this case, we find 160 is greater than, that's the height of the ball, minus 16. Well, let's find our k value. k is going to be f of h and that turns out to be a mess. And I don't feel like doing it right now. For what interval of time is the height of the ball greater than 160 feet? Optional requires quadratic equalities, which are not required. Well, okay, we don't have to do that. This is optional because it requires that we solve a quadratic inequality, and we don't have to do it for this course. After how many seconds will the ball hit the ground? So we have a graph here. So that's the reason it is indeed a mess. And I was thinking we haven't even learned how to do that. And it's not so bad. But since we have not, and that's not part of the course, we're going to have some parabola that opens down. It's not going to look like that, though some parabola that opens down. Actually, it starts right there. So we already know that it starts at zero. So what we want to do is find this value of x right there. And that tells us how many seconds have passed before it hits the ground. Because this is describing something that flies up in the air and comes back down. So we use the quadratic formula. So when we use the quadratic formula, we can calculate b squared minus 4ac. And we're going to see it's greater than 0. So it's going to be the quadratic formula. And my notes tell me when we actually do the quadratic formula, we're going to get two values of t. One is 6.04 and the other is going to be minus 1.04. So this is the only one that makes sense. So after I've traveled 6, because these are values of time, and we don't have negative time. Well, we might, but that's another much more advanced lecture that you'll never get. So 6.04 seconds by the quadratic formula. Okay, that's a good application. And that's it for uh, section 3.1.